Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Hi-Fi Hour. And today I have the absolute honor of talking to one of the mavens in the industry, Mr. Peter Lingdorf. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, Mike. How are you? I'm I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's it's just an honor to have someone um, that has been in the industry and has affected the industry in such positive ways. Um, I, I think uh, you're you're my first audio celebrity on here. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's um, his thought then. Yeah, and and you, I mean, you, I, I'm sure everybody knows you got a lot of stuff going on, but um, I think the audience, let, let, when we get started, let's go ahead and let everybody know how it all began. How did Peter Lingdorf get into hi-fi audio? Uh, well, it's um, kind of simple uh, because when I went uh, in my third, fourth grade in uh, school, I heard the Beatles on the radio. And of course, we didn't. We had public radio where pop music was only allowed a few hours a day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I fell in love with the band. And I thought the composer was a guy called uh, Lennon McCartney. I didn't realize it was two guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I fell in love with music right there and then. And uh, I, I decided uh, I, I needed a tape recorder so I could record this music from the radio and uh, listen to it in the evening and so on. So I started saving money for uh, buying myself a tape recorder. And after a year, I had a, I had a Tenberg Norwegian tape recorder. Okay. Um, and a few months later, I started to build a couple of external speakers that I could use for it. It had the built-in speakers on the side mm -hmm. and uh, two times six watt amplifiers. So that was plenty. Um, so I, I built a couple of uh, home-built uh, peerless uh, speakers with Danish drivers. And okay. after that, I started to build a few loudspeakers for my friends and so on when I went, uh, while I went to school. So, so I've been building speakers since I was 11. Well, so it all started when you were in, the, in primary and then, you know, yeah. in elementary. Yes. Um, yes. That, that's incredible. <clears throat> and uh, did you, have, it, did you feel, have that feeling inside where you're like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I have to do. I have to, I have to do this and, and this would make me happy forever. Is that something, or did you have a different plan when you went into college? I, I had no plan whatsoever. <laughs> I just enjoyed making speakers and I enjoyed listening to music. And I, I uh, actually, once I got to high school, um, it, it went more or less bananas because I had a full-time job next to high school. And I was playing music all the time. And I was buying amplifiers and I was buying a tape recorder that was more expensive than my dad's car. <laughs> and uh, I actually, uh, I left home when I was 15 because my dad did not like the Beatles. Whoa, no. <laughs> yeah, so I got a cheap little apartment in a basement where I could play music. Mm. And I was best friends with my parents, not a problem, but... Um, I just love my music so much, and uh, I, I, I finished high school uh, with the lowest grades in the history of the school, and it was a pretty big school, uh, mm -hmm. but I had made already some nice speakers for my friends, and wow. after high school, I, um, uh, when I was, I was 19 when I finished high school, uh, I worked uh, three weeks in shipping and uh, three weeks in uh, marketing. And then I started my company really? because I thought I had all the experience for shipping and marketing. <laughs> which, and was, started, which was the first company you built? It was actually Audio Nord back in uh, 73. And then 10 years and later, was, that's when, and 10 years later, that's when you made Dali, right? Uh, no, well, that was nine years later, something years like later. that. Uh, but what happened uh, shortly after... Uh, I started um, importing turntables uh, from the UK. And uh, then at a hi-fi show in 1976, I met Gene Sowinski, the owner of Servin Vega. The mm -hmm. only time he was ever at a hi-fi show in Europe uh, was a Penta Hotel in London. And he was, uh, there was one room where I could hear that inside they played extremely loud. Mm -hmm. 
So I walked in. There was actually a sign outside on the door where it says, in this room, we play very loud. If you don't like it, stay out. And in there was Servin Vega, Gene Sowinski with uh, Servin Vega loudspeakers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they played loud, and it was a party atmosphere. He was using a tape recorder because all these bloody turntables would not possibly work with uh, 15 inch woofers in a tiny little room. And I, I got along with Gene Sowinski, and uh, after a few hours, he decided to give me the, um, the agency for Servin Vega for Denmark. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, at that time, I, I was living in a uh, about 150 square foot flat where I had one, I wouldn't call it a flat, but it was a room <laughs> where I had a bed. And I had about 10 turntables at the end of the bed. Oh, wow. Uh, so uh, I, I had a tiny little company. I was making a little bit of money. But Servant Vega really took off. And then just one year later, I um, met the guys from NAD. And I quickly uh, maneuvered myself into the product uh, board to decide what kind of new products should be made. And I be became very good friends with uh, Bjorn Erik Edvardsen, the famous designer from NAD. Um, I was there when he was hired. And we got along really, really well. And uh, a few other guys and myself um, started, uh, you know, coming with inputs for products. And, and the first product he made was the NAD 3020, uh, which became the best-selling uh, hi-fi amplifier in the history. Right. They sold more than a million pieces. Wow. So that was a, a, a nice start. And so I was a distributor until uh, 1980 and then i decided to uh, start my own retail shops because basically i was not so happy about uh, how uh, hi-fi was sold i thought you know it was all about a special price here and special price there and discount and so on and dishonest marketing and so on i, I just hated it so i, I said i, I want to do my own shops and that was uh, where Hi-Fi Gluten started. I started that when I was uh, 26. And, and that is still an ongoing company with 100 shops now. So yes, I did check out the Hi-Fi Gluten website and you have uh, a lot of products on there, a lot of uh, things to be able to buy. Uh, is that more on the European side or do you ship to the US as well? No, we, we, are, we have shops in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Germany, and Holland. And, and those are the markets that we service. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, uh, when, when did uh, Snell uh, come about? Because I know you had a part in Snell as well, right? Yeah, I owned Snell for a few years. And um, it, it came about a couple of years, uh, a few years after Peter Snell, the founder, died. Hmm. Uh, they were making very great products, as you know. And uh, the owner, uh, I, I wanted to, to do the distribution of Snell. And then the owner asked whether I wanted to buy half the company. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And uh, later on, I bought the rest of the company. And um, that was where I met uh, Kevin Wakes, uh, who is now uh, with Harman at their luxury hi-fi division. Um, and uh, Kevin and I started, we started talking about doing a, a digital room compensation technology. And uh, Kevin started looking for engineers that could do the actual coding and uh, the DSP work and so on. And um, in December 1992, we showed the first uh, full range digital room compensation system as a Snell uh, product. Hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I noticed that you've always been interested in room correction from an early, early point because now people recognize room correction and, and they use it and everything. But in, in the, in the 90s, room correction really wasn't uh, very well known in the consumer market, but you were already doing it. 
We were doing it first in Snell, and then um, a few things happened in Snell. My, my partner, who is no longer in the industry, I don't know where he is nowadays, but my CEO of Snell, uh, he uh, fell in love with one of the office ladies. And um, all of a sudden, the company ran out of money, but she has a, had a couple of horses and a farm and a couple of cars. Uh -oh. and expensive jewelry. <laughs> so I had to get rid of my CEO uh, <laughs> and actually also partner. And oh, that no. was a hilarious situation. And then uh, I, I, I got a call from uh, Sandy Berlin, who hmm. was the owner of, uh, before was the owner of uh, Mark Levinson. Okay. After Mr. Mark Levinson. Uh, so he called me out of the blue, more or less out of the blue, because he heard that I didn't have a CEO for Snell anymore. And he wanted to be my partner in Snell, and he wanted to run the company now because he had sold Mark Levinson to Harman. Mm -hmm. So now he had plenty of time, and he would run, like to build up another company. I said, yeah, why, why don't we talk about it? So uh, to make a long story short, what he was really interested in was the room correction technology and, and Kevin Wakes. Mm. And he he uh, actually uh, hijacked Kevin Wakes uh, for Harman, which was a good move on their side. And he tried to also uh, hijack the, the engineering team that did the room correction system, but uh, failed on that. And uh, then I took that technology to NAD Electronics. And we did make an NAD 2.2 uh, room correction system back in 1996. Uh, but then later on, I decided it was not a NAD would not be a good vehicle for products that were so advanced and so expensive because at that time a two channel correction system cost uh, eight thousand US dollars and that was not within the brand realm of of NAD, so to speak. Sure. So it, it sounds like uh, it was a quite the roller coaster with uh, people you worked with. Well, I mean, <laughs> you had the guy that ran off with the secretary and then this guy tried to take your team and yeah. uh, <clears throat> did, did it, um, did it persuade you to kind of step away from the partnership, uh, uh dynamic Approach. and just kind of do it yourself? Well, actually I, I started the tech audio with uh, the partner that was a key engineer for the room correction technology. And I, I had to break up with him a few years later because, um, uh, yeah, that was a sad story, but he oh. basically hijacked our website and started to sell direct for, to the customers oh my God. and broke up the whole distribution system and so on. Um, so that was a sad story also. So I, I must say I, I haven't had great experience with having very close business partners in the U S I can tell. Um, <laughs> well, one thing that people, that I'm beginning to realize, uh, cause I'm fairly new in as an industry, you know, person. I mean, I, I've had a love for music since about the same time you did. I discovered, I think the first album I really fell in love with was a red hot chili peppers album in 1988 or 89, 88, 89. And, okay. um, and, and from there it just went crazy. But, uh, yeah, I, I similar similar background in that aspect. However, um, people don't realize how small this community really is, you know. And when people do something like that, something disingenuous to to another, you know, industry professional, people talk, you know, and people, and, and it's just it's just bad for business for them, you know. Yeah. So obviously, this is why you seem like a great guy, and this is why you you are one of the most successful uh, executives in this, in this, in this industry, let's just be honest. Um, because you, you, you had a genuine beginning from, from what you've told me, you had a genuine beginning yeah. and, and you've, and you worked your way, you worked hard to get to where you are. And that's incredible. And you, you brought technology that people only now are beginning to really explore, which is room correction. You had that going on back in the nineties, you know? <laughs> so yes. So a lot of people don't know stuff like that. And I, and I love the fact that my audience can, can learn. And this is one of the reasons I do these, <clears throat> these hi-fi hours is so 
people can learn, you know, cause a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of people do, uh, a lot of people just think these companies are, are just faceless. They're just, they're just pieces of equipment, right? They don't yeah. know that there's so much work and time <clears throat> and effort and, and personality behind it, you know? Wow. So when I, um, when I first had my experience with, with one of your, one of your products, it's, uh, the Dolly Oberon actually right underneath that little, little flame thing is a, is a Dolly Oberon three. Okay. And I purchased it and I wanted to, cause I wanted to review it myself. And I, I, I just, I didn't have a relationship with, with Dolly at the time. So I, I was in love with the speaker. I loved the way it looked and I had to have it. So <laughs> I got it and man, I, I, I've, I've auditioned it for my friends. I've, I've, you know, I've shown people, uh, what it can do. And it's very, it's a very impressive stand mount speaker for, especially for the price, yes. you know, I, we're talking eight or 900 for the pair. Um, and it, it, it plays well beyond that price range. And, and it actually, <laughs> my friend and I, we did a video, uh, comparing, uh, I, I hate to give away the spoiler of the video because it hasn't come out yet, but it, it won against two other um, options that one of them was actually considerably more expensive. So, yeah. uh, you know, it, it uh, you, you make a great product with Dolly for sure. And what, so yeah. what's going on with Dolly? Are you, are you currently uh, have a, a hands-on um, situation with Dolly or does it kind of have its own thing going on? Well, Dali is now a fairly big company. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we make more hi-fi speakers in Europe than anybody else because most have mm -hmm. moved more or less everything to China or most of their production to China. Um, and, and everything is made in-house then in, in, in Denmark? Actually, we have one Danish factory, which is by far the biggest. It's uh, uh, close to 300,000 square feet now. Mm -hmm. And we have a smaller factory in China where we make uh, all the speaker drivers for the cheaper models. And we assemble crossovers and we do a lot of the labor intensive work in China. But in our own factory, I, I, I do want to be able to tell to customers that, that if they buy a Dali uh, box speaker, it is a Dali speaker. It's made by Dali. It's not made by an anonymous uh, manufacturer. Sure. And we have a lot of uh, things. Uh, we, we do a lot of things very differently uh, at Dali and also at SL Audio and, and the other companies I'm involved with. Uh, one thing is that um, it's, um, you know, when we, when we make our products, when we build our products, it is every single speaker is made by two people. There's two people at finishing speakers together one has to be very very experienced and one can be a newcomer uh, they don't work on a time basis we do not have an external uh, quality check after they have inspected the product of course when we launch a new series and so on we do uh, inspect everything by the engineers and so on but once production is running we have the sophisticated measurement equipment and so on. But the two people, which are usually women, uh, they build, assemble the speakers, and they sign up for the quality. And that means that the speakers you got for review, uh, they were picked randomly from our inventory. And I'm not sure a lot of manufacturers dare to do that. But, but we have that commitment, uh, and everybody in the factory knows that for the customer that is unpacking this pair of speaker, uh, our failure rate is not a statistics. It's either working 100% or it is a total failure. So, so we, have, we do things differently, and, and you could say you, you would think it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. But when the products never fail, when all the customers are happy, uh, then it's very, very productive uh, for the company. Yeah, I mean, I'll be the first to attest. Um, when I when I bought the uh, the Dolly Oberon threes, when they came in, I opened them up, and they had a, a a card that was signed by the inspector, the person that inspected it. Yeah, it, it was so impressive, you know. And 
and, th- and that's something you don't see with, I'd say the majority of mainstream consumer brands in audio is the attention to detail. And let's be honest, the, the, the drivers are beautiful. And, and for the people that haven't seen and have not yet seen a Dolly speaker, I, I do have in my catalog of videos, a full review of the Dolly Oberon threes that you could check out. But, um, I, I, you know, when I, when I opened it up, I was, I was blown away you know, blown away. Oh, and, then, and then I hooked them up <laughs> and that's when the magic really started to, to play in because it was a smart move to use seven inch drivers because you get a little bit more bass response in a traditional six and a half. So you yeah. have that, that, that nice tactile bass. Um, the finish is gorgeous. I got the walnut, uh, the, the wood pulp, uh, drivers, Tell, can you tell me about that? Like, what is the what is the the idea behind the wood pulp? I always wondered that, but I never asked. Well, it is uh, you really want if you are if you have a live material as paper, uh, basically is you really want to randomize it mm-hmm. uh, quite a bit. If it is very small fibers, it is becoming one homogenous piece. But by using the longer fibers, we randomize the breakup modes and so on. Mm. And, uh, and we end up with, with a, more, uh, a much more natural sound, relaxed and uh, not brittle or bright or uh, direct, or, but, but also a more pleasant sound mm. because there's no specific breakup modes. Uh, so that, that was the idea about the, the wood pulp and... and we do a lot of other stuff to the drivers. Uh, originally, we worked very much with Peerless, Vifa, ScanSpeak, but of course now we build everything in house, uh, and uh, so many things that goes into it. The the, the uh, soft magnetic compound in um, in the magnet system assures that uh, some of the ion distortion, which is really a bothersome distortion phenomenon is more or less gone. Hmm. Uh, and you can see that already from the third harmonic distortion, which is typically 20 decibels lower than for uh, other quality drivers. So, and then we do a, a very low um, loss uh, foam surround or rubber surround and spider and so on. So there's a lot of things that goes into the design of the driver. And we do a lot of it based on what we hear. Mm-hmm. One of the, the funny things is that the engineers always do when they put together a new driver, they just take the raw driver, put in pink noise or white noise, and listen to it from all different kind of angles. And it, if, it, if it has something, tonality to it, we're not going to even try it. Oh, wow. It, it just has to have, uh, let's say, a natural flair for all tones. Right. So, so we, we it's it's a little bit like an artwork rather than just purely working with all the measurements and so on. It is an it, 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 beautiful sound, beautiful speaker. Um, you know that that's the first one I, I heard, and then I went to my local hi fi store here in Denver. I live in Denver, uh, close to Denver. Yeah, I went I went to a store called Soundings, and they were able to uh, audition the the ep- Epicons for me. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, we, we did it. Uh, it was powered with, uh, the Boulder 866, which I actually just finished reviewing the Boulder 866. And I put up the, the review video, uh, incredible, mich- incredible, uh, amplifier, but, um, yeah, I believe we were, they were using Nordost cables to, to connect it. Maybe not, maybe, maybe it was ice to tech. I can't remember, but, uh, you know, just a great setup. And I sat there in the chair Sound stage was beautiful, and you know, I mean, these are speakers that uh, you know I, I would have to save up for many many months to uh, to be able to afford. But um, they they are incredible, you know. And and now I'm glad I kind of got a chance to listen to that end of the spectrum, you know. Uh, and yeah. they were they were absolutely beautiful. And in in the same visit, I was able to listen to um, a pair of Viennas that were powered by okay. the Lingdorf, Lingdorf audio integrated amplifier. Okay. And 
and I remember you asked me when we were messaging each other if you ever if I've ever experienced Lingdorf audio, and I had it until that point. And wow, that amplifier! Not only does it look beautiful, and we're talking classy, nice, beautiful, just a beautiful amplifier, and it performed so well with these uh, with these Vienna speakers. And I had never listened to Vienna before, so I didn't really have a sense of uh, reference as to what they really sound like. But mm. I'll tell you what, it, it was just a great experience and a great matching too. a great matching for the for the be, between the Viennas and the in the Lingdorf. So yeah. w- w- when did you start Lingdorf Audio and what what because uh, obviously I've only heard one one piece of equipment, but what what, what does Lingdorf Audio offer to uh, your offerings for that? Well, um, Lindorf Audio uh, started in uh, 2003. And uh, <clears throat> that was after Tech Audio, because at Tech Audio, we had started the room correction. We had continued the development of room correction and so on. Uh, but I had to break up with my partner there. And also in Tech Audio, we had made an amplifier called Tech Millennium. Hmm. which was designed by a Danish guy called Lars Risbo. Uh, Lars Risbo invented the first fully digital amplifier back in 1996. And in 97, he contacted me through one of his friends and said he had this idea about making a fully digital amplifier. And he was working in a big company, and I'm not going to name any names. Um, and they were not really interested because... Uh, they didn't think it was a cheaper way to make an amplifier. Mm. But I listened to his very early prototype of this revolutionary technology because it was actually a digital analog converter that was driving the speaker directly. And I listened to the first prototype and it was a bit noisy and there were some issues and so on, but it has a, a way of, do, of being natural mm-hmm. that, that was so... Nice. Uh, I always like things that doesn't have a tonality by itself. Sure. Um, so I, I, um, I actually offered him to fund the development of the first amplifier based on this technology. And that became the Tech Millennium Amplifier, which came out in 1998. Okay. Um, and it was a fully digital which means it is a D2A converter that drives the speaker directly. There's just one coil and one capacitor in the signal path. And volume control is done in the power supply. Really? Yes. So Hmm. when you turn up and down the volume, you are not changing the signal. In fact, you don't even have a preamp inside. You are not changing the signal. You are just changing the size of the amplifier. And so that it's technology a pure a pure connection directly to the speakers. It is. It is. Wow. Uh, in technical terms, uh, the upper twenty six decibels are handled by the power supply, and below that, we are doing a digital attenuation with the thirty six bit word lengths. But imagine you have an amplifier that always adjusts to the actual level you want to play. It it is a little bit silly to have a power amplifier of 200 watts if you play softly Mm -hmm. because you're just trickle feeding the input and you have this huge dynamic range for no use whatsoever. It just makes noise and you will be using your pre-amplifier at a level that is not the optimum level. There will always be an optimum level for a pre-amplifier. So by this technology, for instance, also in the Lingdorf 3400, where we still use this technology, um, at full blast, um, it's 400 watts into 4 ohms. When we turn down the volume, we reduce the size of the amplifier to about 1 watt. Oh, wow. But we still have the same dynamic range. We do not change the signal when we turn up and down the volume. So people are able to adjust the, the the power of the amplifier depending on their listening. Yeah, you, you don't really think about it when you use the product. 
important. Right. But this technology was invented by Lars back in 1998, and I financed the development. And in the year 2000, um, I had been financing all the patents and so on. So Lars uh, decided to sell the technology to Texas Instruments. And I got the money back for, for the patents and so on. And Lars and I remained best friends. Mm. And I got an agreement with the Texas Instruments that whatever they did in, in digital amplifiers, they would share the knowledge with my little company. Nice. Uh, nice. And uh, Lars was then chief uh, engineer for their digital uh, amplifier technology. Uh, they had a big research uh, facility in Copenhagen. But in uh, 2015, Lars and I uh, started a new company together. Is, is that Steinway Lingdorf? No, that is that, that's the, that, that's a different thing again. Then we'll, we'll <laughs> so, get to that one. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that one. Um, so uh, Lars is is uh, I've always had contact with Lars. He's a fantastic personality. He's so modest. But he's got a lot, around forty patents uh, to his name. Wow! So if you uh, if you have a mobile phone in your pocket, there's probably some of Lars's ideas in it. Um, so uh, Lars and I and Bruno Putzis, uh, known from Hypex and the Key loudspeaker and mm -hmm. a lot of other stuff, and then the former chief engineer for for Peerless, uh, Scanspeak, and Viva in Denmark, the three major speaker manufacturers, driver manufacturers in Denmark, we formed a new company together just, just to make <clears throat> new technology. So that, that, that's a little bit uh, interesting story about that fully digital amplifier technology. But the interesting part is it was invented back in 1996. But we are really the only company that are using the whole potential for that technology because we have all the insights to how best uh, to operate uh, this technology. Now, and is, of that, course, is the company you're talking about Purify? The, the new company is called Purify, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I checked out the website and it looked like you have a lot of components and, and amplifiers and uh, a lot of different things going on there. Um, yeah. That's why I made the comment earlier. I don't know how you have enough time in a day to <laughs> to address every every part of uh, audio that you, you have a, a part of. But I'm sure you have an amazing team now that, that takes care of a lot of things. But you're I'm sure you're a busy man. I am. You know, it's it, I don't feel very busy most days. Um and and uh, the thing is that it is such a joy to work with people like uh, the people at Dali, the people at Hi-Fi Klubben, because we have a company culture that I think goes through every part of the, the, the different uh, subsidiaries, Lingdorf Audio, Dali, uh, Purify, which is not uh, owned by me uh, more than about one third. Hmm. The other two thirds are Lars and, and Bruno primarily. Um, but we are all in it for the music. We are all in it for the customers. And I, I have some very simple demands to everybody that, that work in my organization. And uh, to put it in a popular way, I say we never piss down. You heard me right. <laughs> and that means if you're formally the boss, you have to be the most polite of everybody. And the final boss in the company is our customer. And if we don't make the customer happy, we are screwed. Exactly. So who is the closest to our customers? In Hi-Fi Club, it is the sales staff. So they are royalty inside the company. And management is there to support their best efforts. Uh, likewise, at the Dali factory, we cherish the production workers because they are the ones that are closest to the customers. So, for instance, when I visit SL Audio, I always go to production first. 
I bypass management, engineering, everybody, and I go straight into production. And I tell them, you did a great job last month. We had zero failures. It is absolutely fantastic. And I, I talk to them every time I come there. That's the first job because they're the closest to the customers. And you know, demanding, it's not like demanding, but it's just that we have to remember the customer is king. And everybody is then automatically more proud to work in a company with that kind of attitude uh, than for a lot of other companies where you just say the profit is the, the end game and so on. We very rarely talk about profit unless we have none. Then we start to talk about it <laughs> because it is necessary at the end of the day. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. After people, if, if people are watching this in, in Europe, uh, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of applications and resumes because that is a great company culture to have. You know, uh, to to value, to overvalue and 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 really uh, put your effort into your frontline workers, you know, your, your manufacturing staff, your yeah. sales staff, the, the people that are out there, you know, making sure that the business is running well, that's the best practice. I think yeah. <clears throat> I've, 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 I've always studied that. I've always studied, you know, management styles and, and things like that, especially when I was in college, I, you know, I took a lot of classes that, that, you know, uh, they they teach w one way or the other, you know, but, uh, you know, I never believe, yeah, you have to have profits, you know, you, if you don't have profits, you don't have a company. However, if you take care of those people, like you said, you won't have to worry about the profits because people are going to want to come to work. People are going to be happy to be there. People are yeah. going to, people are going to be, you're going to be their biggest fan, you know, like, so yeah, great, great job on that, you know, because there's not yeah. too many CEOs and executives that think like that. Only no, and it, 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 I wonder all the time with all this kind of top-down management and, and so on that it is so, it is so unproductive. Um, we, we have simple rules, for, for instance, uh, if we have a shop manager, he's got four or five staff in the shop. If one of them screws up, the first thing he has to do is go and give that guy an apology. Seriously, sorry, Mr. This and that or whatever. And I am sorry, I did not instruct you well enough. And I didn't explain well enough that this is an, a, a, an important part of the job. That, that is never, is never pointing fingers or being angry. It is... I'm sorry, I didn't explain this well enough. That is such a great philosophy because yeah. then the worker's probably like, you don't have to apologize. You know, it was my fault. No, no, you know, <laughs> but that also, but it, it doesn't create tension. It doesn't create conflict. It doesn't create a, you, you know, because a lot of times, more often than not, probably two out of three times, <clears throat> you encounter a boss that, you know, uh, you mess up, the boss goes over there and, and just reams you, you know, he, he just lets you have it and you're sitting there, you know, taking it, you know, but that, what does that create? It creates hostility that creates a, a very, uh, not, not friendly work environment that then you, you're automatically, you're, you're ruled by fear. And yeah. I, I don't, I don't believe that should be, uh, a, a, a good philosophy or process for, for any company just to be ruled no. by fear, you know, and, and that's another, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why I decided to just branch out and do my own thing, uh, and, and run my own social media business, because I, I have encountered too many of those not positive bosses, you know, and had, had I known you were like that, I would have, I would have flown to Copenhagen a long time ago, but, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I know, think it's in Denmark, we, we have a very egalitarian society. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you know, for a factory worker, if, if a factory worker gets sacked, he mm -hmm. will or she will get about 90% of the salary still. Mm -hmm. So people are basically not afraid of being sacked. And, and that also means that as an employer, you have to make the working environment 
friendly and good and nice and interesting and so on. Uh, but but very few companies do it as much as we do. Sure. So Still. how long do they get that 90% for after they get sacked? I don't know the exact. Uh, it depends on the total employment situation. If there's full employment and so on, the government will expect them to go out and find another job within sure. a reasonable time frame. So it's kind of like a, like the unemployment process we have here in America where you, you get sacked and you get a little bit of unemployment if it wasn't your fault. And yeah. And you go from there. Yes. Okay. But yeah, 90%. We here in America, we get, I think, 40, 50%, if that, you know, yeah. and it's for a very small period of time. Well, granted, it because of what's going on right now, a lot of things changed. Sure. But, um, and we seem to be the, the leaders of, of, of that, of the pandemic. But, uh, yeah. you know, well, that, I guess that's a good question. Um, I've spoken with a lot of executives and owners in this, in this industry. And they have told me that as, as unfortunate as the pandemic has been for globally, for everybody, it actually, a lot of companies are seeing a little spike in sales over the last year because a lot of people are, are stuck at home, yeah. you know, and they, they, they got to do something, you know, and, and a lot of them still have a considerable amount of money to spend. So. Do you guys feel that you've done okay during the, I mean, obviously across a lot of, you own a lot of companies, but overall, did you see a little spike or, or, or were you kind of normal business? We have actually seen a lot of business. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen uh, a good improvement of business uh, up more than 10% over last year. Oh, wow. And, um, and we have been selling higher quality product. So people uh, have been interested in buying just a much better quality, which people makes me very happy because, you know, they're going to stay in this game if they mm -hmm. get something that is really, really good. Well, people have more time now to, yeah. to kind of research and, and study <clears throat> and actually see what they really want. Um, I think the only downfall of, of what's, what's been, well, aside from in, in audio, the only downfall <clears throat> is the fact that a lot of hi-fi stores have been closed. Yeah. So it's been kind of tough for people to go demo and audition uh, speakers, amplifiers, you know, components. Um, and that kind of makes things tough because uh, let's say a company is doing direct sales, you know, to the consumer. That just means if if the customer, when they get the product, they think it's a little too bright or too flat, or whatever, you know, yeah. and they send it back, all of a sudden now you got a open box product that you have to get rid of. And, and it's just direct selling with audio is, 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 is kind of a risk. Don't you think? It, it is a risk. And uh, the reason we have done well is that uh, my retail business it has a, a reputation for being honest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, the way we describe a product, we never fail to mention the few drawbacks there are on certain products. Even the Lindorf products, when we sell them in Hi-Fi Gluten, there's all the the the, the, you know, the bullet points, uh, qualities, and all of that. And then at the bottom, they'll say, but this it cannot do, and this it cannot do. So we're always dead honest uh, about the way we, we, we do our marketing and and so on. So uh, I, that is helping us also during the pandemic because a lot of our shops have been closed also. But uh, the overall effect on our business has been positive. Okay. <clears throat> I have an interesting question for you. So um, a lot of people are starting to realize that I am a huge proponent for compact disc and the resurgence of compact discs. I think mm. they, I think they can, I think they can have the a similar. I think a similar return as we've seen with uh, vinyl, um, because it's a it's a nostalgic you know experience. You know, obviously with vinyl, and vinyl has a very beautiful sound. And I think uh, compact discs have a very paired with the right transport and DAC can very well sound better than high res streaming. So, 
do you are you a proponent of 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 physical media? Uh, how do you consume your media? Do you prefer streaming? Do you prefer CD? Or are you still going to stick with the classic vinyl, which I know that's how you what you what you enjoy the most, right? Well, I I don't have a record player the last four or five years. What? <laughs> I should and, I should bleep uh, that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's it's also because the last four or five years have been very very busy, mm. and the I I thoroughly enjoy the very good multi-channel uh, recordings mm-hmm. uh, in high resolution. Some of them are just phenomenally good. And, and when you hear those in multi-channel with a very good processor, mm-hmm. which we also do with a, a at Lindorf Audio, um, it, it just, there is no comparison to even the best tuned uh, LP system. It is just more relaxed. It's it, it's so pure. It's so clean. It's unbelievable. Uh, with regards to CDs, I think uh, a lot of people have a misconception about CD because during the '90s and uh, early 2000s, up up till about four or five years ago, a lot of CDs sounded downright dreadful, hmm. and um, the the um, the producers were brick walling the sound, which means that all the peaks went to zero and sometimes ab- above. And uh, a few things happened then, even in high quality decks. If if you have a CD that goes to zero dBFS all the time, mm-hmm. there will actually be intersample clipping distortion, mm-hmm. and even the best decks produce a lot of intersample clipping distortion that sounds like awful. Um, and it's, it's something that is quite easy to compensate. At all the Lingdorf products, we, add, we do an intersample clipping compensation uh, technology that makes sure you don't get that distortion. It is something that the high-end manufacturers have neglected because they're always listening to their superb uh, Telag recordings and Chesky recordings and so on. Where this phenomenon is not is not there, sure. but if you play one of the highly compressed pop rec- uh, CDs, it's awful, and some of that problem can can uh, can be removed. Uh, then, in general, there has been the of course the loudness war, which peaked uh, in a, in my estimate about five years ago, <clears throat> where the dynamic range or the the peak to loudness ratio of CDs was shrinking and shrinking and shrinking uh, down to something that was downright uh, ridiculous. Uh, if you take a Metallica album, for instance, CD, the, the average level is uh, much louder than steady state pink noise. So mm-hmm. if you have all frequencies all the time at maximum SPL, it is less loud than a Metallica album. And that means that something is seriously going wrong with the music. And a lot of that kind of bad sound on CDs has been attributed to the format, but it has nothing to do with the format. Mm -hmm. It is bad production, over compression and so on. That has been improving over the last few years, also because actually because of streaming. Because at streaming, they are loudness normalizing, so now the producers do not become louder compared to the other uh, albums if they compress the sound. So, so there has been a lot of bad CDs out there, but CDs, of course, can sound absolutely magnificent. Mm-hmm. But I would, I, would tell, I would say that if you bought a CD between the year 2000 and 2010, maybe 0.05% of those CDs had the optimum sound quality that you could achieve by a CD. See, then, that's, a shame. that's a shame because there's a lot of music in, in yeah. that time period that I really, really, really like. Actually, that's yeah. when between 2000 and 2010 is when a lot of my more favorite bands started to really make some incredible things. And of course, I mean, I 
I love the heritage of the eighties and nineties and everything, but, uh, man, you, yeah. you, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> <laughs> but then going back to LPs, there was this problem with CDs. Mm -hmm. There was an un un unnecessary problem because the, of the loudness war wow. and the compression of the music, the dynamic range compression. Then if you produce an LP, you cannot compress the sound so much because the needle wouldn't be able to track. Right. So in fact, a lot of LPs have been produced and, and mastered much nicer than the corresponding CD. So now the LP sounds better, not because of its vinyl or because of the cartridge or anything, but because the production is different. Sure. So uh, I hope now with the um, MQA and so on uh, that the record, the music labels will start to work more on the sound quality again. And there is a tendency that uh, the later albums have much better dynamic range or peak to loudness ratio than before. So I think we're through the worst and I think pro music productions are getting better quite fast now. I, I think a lot of, I, I think as the technology grows, because like you mentioned, we have, you know, Tidal, Quo Buzz, both who yep. do, who, I mean, I think MQA and the master quality is, is uh, maybe 10, 15% of their catalog. But when you listen to it, um, actually it was funny because we were talking about him earlier, um, Mads Clifford with, uh, with Audio Vector. Yep. Yep. He's the one that turned me on to, to Tidal. He said, yes. because I told him, I was told, I told him, because I, 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 I did a, a good amount of streaming, you know, and stuff like that, but I was using Spotify and I would use my CDs, CDs and Spotify is how I consume my content before. And Madge is like, no, no, try title and then do an A and B. Yeah. It, it, it's absolutely. And I know Spotify just, just announced their hi-fi version or whatnot, but yes. for, for, for what it was. Their, their, their highest quality possible on Spotify at the time. This was about a year ago, two years ago. No, a year ago. <clears throat> um, compared to Tidal, there's no comparison. Tidal, no. Tidal completely blows it away. And Quobas and Tidal, I think, are kind of neck and neck. Uh, yes. I, I really don't see much of a difference. But yeah, between between those two and, and Spotify, there's no question. You know that there's... No, and and, and once you listen to Tidal or Cubus uh, for a little while, you realize that that the um, the data reduction systems that Spotify and the, and the whole sound management and so on it is very very bad, mm -hmm. and and it's quite easy to hear what is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm happy that Spotify is also now improving quality. Yeah. Um, I, I you know one interesting uh, thing that. A lot of people are not thinking about. In 1982, when the CD format was defined, that's 38 years ago now. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much it would cost to put one CD on hard disk? How much hard disk capacity would that right. require? And what the, would that hard disk cost? I don't know. What, what was it? In today's money, 250,000 US dollars to put First. one CD. On hard disk for a CD burner. No, that was just to record or to to store one CD on a hard disk. Oh my gosh, that's crazy! That that was actually a year before I was born. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, just, I just turned I just turned thirty eight. But yeah, um, yeah. So, I, it was Sony and Philips, right? That that did the first. It was one. Sony and Philips, yeah. Yeah, but but it's kind of mind boggling. That with the with the development of digital technology that has been, you know, now it costs one cent or less to store one CD on a hard disk, compared to two hundred fifty thousand US dollars. In the same time frame, the actual quality that people have been consuming mm -hmm. has gone down mm -hmm. in a digital format, and that is just unbelievable that the music labels have not done more to improve quality because all the options are there. Now, uh, do, are they still making, uh, cause I heard a rumor that, that, that they're, they're not making the, 
the players anymore. The, the transports, they're just whatever's out there is out there kind of thing. I don't know how much truth is behind that. Do, do, you, do any of your companies make CD players? The Lunar Auto is making a CD player, and it is not easy to find a good uh, CD drive. Right. We have to be very careful about parts uh, availability and so on. Because the only people that were making them were, were TIEC and Sony Philips. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I think more people should jump on that. But um, so wait, so you're making one or you've already made one? Well, we've made CD players for many years, more than 10 years. Okay. Now, now I'm interested here. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I mean, I've heard a lot of people, uh, this is the, the, the great debate, right? With anything, with cables, with anything. Uh, people, some people say, oh, well, a transport's a transport as long as you have a really good deck. And I'm like, no, that's not the case. You know, you got to worry about jitter. You got to worry about a lot of things. <clears throat> yeah. A transport is not just a transport and a player is not just a player. Um, I, I think it's important to make sure it's, it's built correctly, you know, and it, and it has a good, a good pairing with a good match with, with a DAC and a good match with the system. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you've, you've been a part of many discussions where it, it's just like people think it's either white or black, you know, mm. uh, there's no gray area. There's no compromise. It's, it's just either it is or it isn't. And I've had discussions with people about cables and and things like that because I, I I've heard like a lot of people with the opinions haven't experienced it, you know. They no. they think that they know because it's oh I'm, I'm an electrical engineer and I don't think it has anything to, but but those electrical engineers that have opinions about stuff they don't, they're not electrical electrical engineer in audio, you know. No. And and there's a lot of stuff that goes on between microphonics and all the other stuff that people should be aware of, you know? Yeah. And uh, I always uh, remind everybody that when we do things in the digital domain, uh, any mistake, any error is awful. It's hideous. It's a disaster. Mm -hmm. If you make small mistakes in the analog domain, an amplifier or something may sound a little bit dull or a little bit muffled or something, but it's never going to sound awful. Mm -hmm unless it's really bad, but a little bit bad in digital is awful by definition. And that that's uh, regarding jitter and that's regarding distortion and so on. Uh, so you have to do, you have to take extra, extra care. Mm. And a lot of the engineers at, at uh, Lingdorf Audio, they come from the pro industry. Mm. Uh, so one of the things when we, when we do a CD player and uh, the, the fully digital amplifiers and so on, uh, we make sure that the, the digital interface is really, really good. Uh, That's always a good thing. Yeah, uh, it, and it has to be reliable. It has to work with basically any cable and so on. So every time I hear somebody say that a digital cable makes wonders of difference, uh, I have to conclude that is because the interface between the two products is not up to scratch right um, because if, if that is good then the quality of the cable should have absolutely no influence on the sound hmm. uh, when when we're talking digital right 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 and in the steinway systems uh, of course we always use uh, cat six cables for sound really yes but okay, it's so our own protocol, and we are reclocking, and we're doing all the right thing. So this is something we haven't. This is our. This was the the, the cherry on top was the Steinway Lingdorf, and um, for those of you that haven't, I, I think I've posted a few pictures of of Steinway Lingdorf uh, on my on my Instagram feed. However, this is probably some of the most beautiful pieces of of of, of musical art out there. I've never heard one personally, hmm. but the look alone, I mean, you have that classic Steinway and Sons bl gloss black, you know, piano black, and then the technology of Lingdorf Audio had a baby and that's what it is, you know? And <laughs> yeah. I was, when I saw, when I first saw it online, I was like, no way that is gorgeous. You know, that is incredible. So how did that how did that partnership come about? It, it was um, 
one of our Lingdorf customers from Sweden, mm-hmm. he had bought a Lingdorf system with uh, Lingdorf uh, amplifier, the, a very early room perfect system, the room correction system that we now we developed uh, more than thirteen years ago, and um, he just called and said. Now he was listening to piano recordings, and it was the first time he ever heard a piano sound like a piano from a hi-fi system, ever. And he happened to know the management for, of Steinway and & Sons, and the owner of Steinway and & Sons. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, I've, I've already called the guys at Steinway, they should hear this. So uh, he had an invitation for me to go and visit the management uh, at Steinway & Sons in New York. Mm-hmm. So I went over there, and uh, and uh, they were kind of interested in doing licensing the name for some audio products if they were super high quality and if they would uh, be, you know, good enough for their brand. So uh, we, uh, I made a challenge for myself, and I said, okay, I'm gonna set up a prototype system in about uh, eight months or something like that. And then we put it up in a hotel room of your choice, or any room of your choice. And I'm gonna reproduce a Steinway Grand Piano uh, so that you can't hear whether you're actually listening to a piano or the speaker system. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and, And then I'm gonna throw in a symphony orchestra also just for good measure. And the CEO of Steinway said, "Okay, Peter, if you can if you can pull off that trick, uh, then I think we can talk business." And uh, so that was actually what we did. We were invited over, and we um, had this hotel room, a fairly dreadful room. We set up the prototype system, which later became the Model D, and um, we showed the the visuals of the design and so on, and. Um, they had the, some of the best piano trimmers there because they were listening for any faults in the reproduction. And um, we were playing a lot of piano recordings, a lot of classical music and so on. And at one stage, the, the uh, probably at that time, the best piano tuner in New York, he pointed between the speakers when we listened to a piano recording. He sat with his eyes closed and pointed between the speakers and he said, Peter, I tell you, to make a Steinway sound so perfect is a damn difficult job. And of course, he was thinking about the tuner that had tuned that piano that we were listening to on our speakers. Uh, So anyway, uh, half an hour later, the CEO of Steinway said, Peter, we want this to be a Steinway and Sons product. We had been talking about just licensing the Steinway name, Steinway, and that's it. But he said, this is so good, it has to be a Steinway and Sons. Wow. And so we, we made a deal with Steinway and Sons there and then. And when was that deal uh, finalized? Was that a few years ago? Is it pretty that, new? That was in 2005. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm 15 I'm years ago. Um, yeah, <laughs> that is incredible. The fact that you were able to present something to, to the, to the owner of Steinway and, and he, he was blown away, you know, yeah. because it, it's, they, they, they don't make, you know, inexpensive pianos. They, they're probably, oh. if not the best, you know, piano manufacturer in the world. Yes, and for for you to well, create for you to recreate a a loudspeaker that can that can capture that essence that uh, that 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 the beauty of listening to a, a grand piano live, you know, yeah. that, that's incredible. So, we're gonna make a video as soon as this COVID situation is over. We're gonna make a an actual um, demo at a, in a concert hall in Denmark where we're gonna show people uh, exactly that. We're going to put a pair of speakers on a stage mm-hmm. and a Steinway grand piano. And we'll challenge the audience to hear whether it's a piano playing or our speakers. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that would be. That, 
you have to let me know how that goes <laughs> because yeah, well, I, I don't think people are going to be able to tell the difference. To be, we're honest. not going to be very discreet about the about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So what's coming up? Uh, any any new plans? Any any new companies you're 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 thinking about, or, or are you kind of just kind of do roll in with the punches with what you got already? Well, uh, now that uh, we have this, <clears throat> we have four different. Uh, product development centers. We have one at, at Dali in Denmark, one at SL Audio in Denmark. Then we have Purify outside of um, Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And um, then we have another smaller one in Denmark uh, because I have another brand called Argon Audio. Mm. And Argon Audio is making fairly cheap speakers, cheaper than Dali, and fairly cheap electronics. Uh, but uh, with really, really good quality. We're mm -hmm. not exporting that uh, yet. So we have those uh, engineering facilities, and, and they're separate, but of course they're collaborating. And I then with Purify Audio, we are really doing fundamental research in loudspeaker design, in uh, amplifier uh, mm -hmm. design, in power supply designs, and so on. And uh, that is uh, run by uh, Lars Rispo, Bruno Putzis, and a few other really, really good guys. I think among the engineers there, there are more than 60 patterns in uh, digital amplification, loudspeaker design, and so on. Uh, this company is supplying technology for everybody. The new NAD uh, M33 amplifier has the Purify amplifier technology. <clears throat> And um, we are also, we have designed in that company a new, new measurement technology for speaker drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, because the first thing Lars Rispo looked at when we wanted to do speaker drivers is, what is wrong with all this measurement technology? It's old fashioned, it's totally outdated. We can't measure anything that is significant. Mm -hmm. So he designed the new measurement technology together with Bruno Butzis, and that took four years. Wow. And based on that, uh, they started to work on, on the actual measurements on existing drivers and found all different kinds of problems. And they incidentally found that well, after they developed this uh, measurement technology, that the drivers with the lowest distortion were coming from Dali. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> with I'm not kind surprised. Of because, yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, Dolly, and, Dolly has such a beautiful sound. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that is kind of my latest baby, so to speak, and 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 that is so uh, wonderful. You know, all the companies are wonderful in different ways. The Dali engineers are fantastic engineers. The CEO of Dali, uh, I hired him straight out of the university. Uh, and he then later became CEO of the factory and uh, running the factory so, so extremely well. So, and he's also an engineer. So we have so many superb engineers also at SL Audio that are just bringing up ideas like, like crazy. Hmm. So I, I think we're, we're not going to expand into more different uh, brands. I don't think so. Also, I promised my wife that at some time we should go on vacation now and then and so on. Well, so, I have an idea for a vacation. So you should totally come to Rocky Mountain Audio Fest and have a beer with me for I would, vacation. I've, I've <laughs> never been to that show. I would love to go to that show. It, the the hotel they, they hosted at is beautiful. It's called the Gaylord. It's uh, it's an incredible, it's right by the, the Denver International Airport. Yeah. And it, it is just, I, I went in 2019. That was my first time going because it was my first, my second year here in Denver. So okay. I, I went and beautiful, beautiful show. Wonderful. Just, just wonderful. Uh, Marjorie does a really good job with that show. Um, now I have plans to possibly go to Expona if it happens and uh, there's one in Florida as well. I've been wanting to check out, but are you going to be going to, is Munich going to happen this year? I, 
I kind of doubt it, uh, or mm-hmm. at least it's going to be scaled back because, you know, even if the pandemic is maybe under control at that time, I think a lot of the Asians will be hesitant about going. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, I think uh, I would call it a 50-50 chance, but officially it's still on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna have to come over here and hang out. I'd love to. <laughs> what, what, uh, what, what, which shows do you usually uh, participate in? Normal. Last few years, it's been uh, the ISE and the CDM has been the primary shows because uh, at Lingdorf Audio and Steinway, we're doing a lot of multi-channel systems. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have not done a lot of hi-fi shows with, uh, with Lingdorf Audio. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we, we should do that in the future. Well, I, mean, I think if I heard a Lingdorf... Uh home theater i think i'd be blown away you should be <laughs> <laughs> well, we just um, made a major deal with one of the production companies american production companies for multi-channel processors for all their uh, mastering studios really now I'm, I'm gonna have to keep my eyes open whenever <laughs> whenever that happens um peter i want to thank you for coming on the show uh, i know we've ran a little over an hour but uh it, it was a pleasure learning about you and talking to you. And I always like making you friends and, and, you know, you, you seem like a great guy, you know, thanks. And you, you've been such an influence on this. Uh, you, I mean, let's just right off the bat, you, you learned and worked with some of the greats from the beginning, you know, oh, yeah. and now you're one of the greats yourself. So <clears throat> you, you scaled in a, in a perfect way. And now you, you have a, you've left behind legacies. Of, of, of companies, you know, and now you're, you're, whatever you create next is probably going to be even more incredible, you know? So I, 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 hope. I cannot wait to see what the future holds for, for you and for Lingdorf audio. And I would love to have you back whenever you have an announcement or a launch or anything, or if you just want to talk, um, uh, I, you're more than welcome to come back. And I, I would love to work with you in the future as well. Thank you, Mike. No problem. Uh, and everybody, you can get all of the details on all of the Lingdorf uh, audio companies uh, right in the description below. Make sure to check that out. And we will see you next week for another edition of Hi-Fi Hour.